Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is a binocular update. And with me here in the studio is Ken Anderson to uh, cover this exciting topic. Ken, why binoculars? Why not a telescope? Well, that's a very good question. Well, binoculars, uh, they, they give you the natural two-eye seeing that we we're so used to seeing. And with using two eyes, you get a square root of two uh, multiplier signal to noise uh, that your brain interprets. So, so we're programmed to have stereo vision. Right. We have two eyes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you also get twice the aperture than a monocular. So uh, one, one advantage of uh, binoculars is that you have a wider true field of view than you can get with, with a telescope. And that's mainly why I like binoculars so much. I do have a large Dobb telescope that I, sh that I brought on the sh uh, show several times. Right. Um, also, um, uh, binoculars are much smaller and they're more portable than a large telescope. So I was able to take uh, my binoculars on my trips and even brought my big binoculars to Hawaii. Um, the small ones are very hand-holdable and uh, often uh, the, the manufacturers or the sites will say they recommend 7 by 50 binoculars. Uh, my personal limit is a 9 by 63 or a 15 by 63 Orion Mini Giant to hand hold and that's uh, they're both 2.3 pounds each um, but uh, when I use the 15 power I do use a monopod uh, to uh, keep it more steady. Uh, also uh, with binoculars uh, they're much lower cost than a telescope so it's a very low cost of entry uh, to, to get involved with learning the sky, uh, the night sky with small binoculars. Well, right. I mean, if you're thinking that you're interested in this, before you spend a boatload of money, spend a smaller amount if you enjoy it. Uh, like we all do, we just go up from there. Right. So, uh, are there different types of binoculars? Uh, yes, there are. You have the Poro binoculars that are straight through, straight through binoculars. Uh, you have roof-mounted binoculars that they normally have the, the right angles because uh, the prisms bring the, the eyepieces together because together your eyes aren't so spaced apart as okay. larger binoculars. So they're actually bending the light back and forth to get it into that, the separation right. between our eyes. And then uh, uh, roof-mounted come with either BAK4 or BK7, uh, which are both pretty good coatings, and Steve will co cover that in the term. Those are their types of glass? Uh, right. Okay. okay. And, then, uh, and then you have uh, zoom binoculars, uh, I personally don't recommend those because you get a narrow, narrower field of view and the whole point of having binoculars is to get the wide field of view. Um, and then you have image stabilized binoculars which uh, provide uh, extra hand, hand hold stabilization uh, and for moderate and higher aperture binoculars that uh, get rid of the, the hand hold shake but those are very costly. I see. Yeah, because that would be a problem trying to hold binoculars. Obviously, the lighter they are, the easier they are to hold. Right. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you could tell us a little bit about some of the specifications on binoculars. Okay. Well, every binocular comes with two numbers. Uh, it's the magnification times the aperture. So, and, and I like to look at it, and also the Canadian Handbook says, that if you multiply both those numbers, you really get a visibility factor which tells you how much and how good you can see. So if you multiply a 7 by 50, which gives you, uh, or, or, or a 5 by 50, which gives you 250, yeah. you know, you can compare that, uh, those numbers. And the higher the numbers, how much you're able to see. So the magnification, uh, that gives you the power. So. Uh, Lower magnification gives you a, a, a larger, wider field of view of the sky, and it also gives you ease of hand holdability um, if you had 10 times power or below. Um, the higher magnification yields much greater detail, but you see less portion of the sky. So that works much as, as a telescope does in, in yeah. that regard. Okay. And then also for aperture, the aperture gives you the light gathering and the luminance. 
So the smaller aperture are more hand-holdable, but it has darker skies. You see less stars. You see less deep sky objects. Uh, 7 by 50 is the most common or recommended, and that gives you a 7 millimeter exit pupil, which is the largest exit pupil uh, younger people can have. Uh, the larger aperture may require a monopod or a tripod, uh, but with that you see brighter skies, you see more stars, you see more deep sky objects. A, a bigger light bucket, just as we talk about that, in telescopes. Exactly. Aperture rules. Yeah. Yep. So uh, 50 millimeters, or, or in my case 63 millimeters, uh, the Orion Mini Giants, those are what I call the typical uh, limit for hand holdability. Okay. After that, they're getting too heavy and you're just... Then you have to switch to tripods. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, now there are various types of uh, binoculars or styles, if you wanted to use that term. Uh, we've talked about the various polar prism and roof prism, but let's get to the different types. Okay. So uh, we're going to be starting going from uh, lowest power to highest power. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm starting off with the, the Galilean binoculars uh, named after Galileo because they, um, they, they use his design. Okay. And, and these are basically for viewing the whole constellation, so constellation viewing. So the first one I have here, this is the, the Kazai uh, Blue, Op Blue Planet Optics uh, 2.3 times 40 millimeter binoculars. Uh, they give you a, a 28 degree uh, field of view. Um, there, I have them mounted on uh, a hands-free headset, uh, and if you, I have this little clip where you can see me uh, uh, wearing these for my minion Halloween costume, like in this uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, sure. uh, theme, and uh, uh, you can see me uh, taking off uh, these uh, uh, this headset, um, and. Uh, these provide very low, they have very low eye relief, and they have small eyepiece openings, so I, they're not recommended for eyeglass wearers, but the closer you can get them to your eye, the wider the field of view. And I also have uh, filter holders that I can use the different filters on, and I got the hands-free headset for this particular case. So you could actually see a whole constellation just as if you were looking up with just your eye. That's correct. And, and you can see, like, you know, so what you would see is you can pan the Milky Way, you can see the Pleiades and the Hades in the same field of view, uh, you're able to see Orion's belt with the sword in the same field of view. M32, Andromeda Galaxy, looks like a complete sky chart with all the guide stars to the galaxy. Um, and also, uh, you can view many planets in the same field of view. Uh, and uh, it's great for fireworks, sporting events, theaters, concerts, and uh, your kid events, so it's really good. The next one I have in my hand is uh, the Vixen 2.1 by, by 42 millimeters. Uh, these also have very low eye relief and uh, larger eyepiece openings, uh, but they're easier uh, to use in the daytime and meter shower viewing when you hold them quickly up to your eye, you know, because because they have much larger eyepiece openings, so you know it's eye, eyepiece location is not as critical. Right. Um, so I do use uh, these for, and and the KSI ones for meteor showers, but I probably use it half the time because you're missing at least two thirds of the meteors, but they look a lot better. Okay. Uh, and then these other ones that I have here, I actually made these uh, myself. Um, and they use uh, um, uh, Nikon TC E2 two times power or Nikon TC uh, E3 EDs, those are three times power. And I have a, uh, a website, uh, it's www.cloudynights.com, that uh, uh, you can look at and go to the binocular forum, and it tells you where you can get the stereo lift CAD, and uh, you know, uh, it, it gives you a site where you can go to see where it can be made. So it gives you both the designs for both of these, and uh, you know, you, you select the location where you want it made, but 
it, it has a whole choice of companies uh, that you can make them at. Oh, very uh, those, you do need to wear glasses when you're use, uh, using them because they're, they're uh, camera telephoto lenses and uh, uh, they don't have any focusing device. So you need to have your glasses. Oh, so you're, you've got to find your focus manually in this manner. Okay. All right. All right, good. So those are a couple of the different types of uh, telescopes that, uh, I'm sorry, binoculars. Binoculars, I'm a telescope guy. But uh, it's interesting to see the variations between ones that almost act as your own eyes, as the ones you showed us there a mo moment ago, or even this newer type, which I was, was totally unfamiliar with. So um, from here, uh, I think we would move, start moving to talk about larger telescopes. And now I actually think that this would be a great time to take our break before we move into the uh, next segment of larger scopes. And so what we're going to do is take that break. Uh, if you have a question, send us an email. Um, you have the email address down there at the bottom of your screen. We do like seeing those come in. And coming up next is Term of the Month. Stephen? The Term of the Month is BAC4 versus BAC7. BAC4 is an acronym that the German manufacturer Schott uh, coined uh, to talk about the crown glass used in their binoculars. It's a barium crown glass. It's highly reflective and it has a circular exit pupil, which means that you get more light to the periphery, to the edges of your field of view. Uh, BAC7 is not as reflective, and it has these square, uh, square-ish uh, uh, exit pupil, and so the uh, edges of your field of view are grayer or dimmer. Uh, this is not a problem at all in daytime use, which means that you have a cheaper glass, a cheaper binocular, and uh, they're just they're fine for daytime use, uh, bird watching, and so on. Uh, Unfortunately, there are two types of BAC4 glass, and the other is a Chinese glass, which is a phosphate uh, crown, uh, uh, crown glass. And it is not quite as good as the German barium, and, uh, and often it's not labeled. Term of the month, BAC4 versus BAC7. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. Our topic is, of course, binocular update show. And uh, we're going to move along and start talking about larger size binoculars. So, Ken, take it away. Okay. So the first one I'm going to talk to uh, talk to you about is uh, the Vixen Ascot. It's 10 by 50 uh, super wide binoculars. It gives you eight and a half degree field of view uh, with a five millimeter exit pupil. It, it has a combination of both lenses and mirrors to get that wide view, and it is hand holdable and. Uh, um, it, that, but you do have less shake and you're able to see more detail uh, when you put it on a monopod as I have to my left. Uh, but you are able to lay down and sit down in a zero gravity chair or lie down on the ground and look up at the, the zenith. Uh, what can you see in these? You can see the entire Hades, the Pleiades, Beehive star clusters look very good. The belt of Orion looks really good. Uh, the sword of Orion and M42 is visible. Uh, and you can see uh, many multiple DSOs in the same view, such as uh, M81, 82, comets and planets, et cetera, et cetera. Deep sky objects. Exactly. There you go. Um, and now I'll switch to uh, uh, my, my favorite uh, monopod type binoculars. What I have up here is I have uh, the 15 by 63, uh, 3.7 degree uh, apparent field of view. These, these have a four, 4.5 millimeter exit pupil, 29 millimeter eye relief. Uh, both of these are 2.3 pounds, uh, and this one is marginally hand holdable, so I almost always use it on the monopod. But the monopod, you can raise up and down, and you can tilt it, um, and uh, you know, so you, you can get it over your head and look right at the zenith. One thing I want to point out about the monopod, it's very easy to quick change. So I'm going from the 15 power over to the 9 power, and you could see that it's very quick. But even as quick as this was, when you only had two and a half minutes for the solar eclipse, I didn't want to give any 30 seconds up 
to go switch. No, that's for sure. Switch to view. So these are these are the nine by sixty threes. So if I hand holded them, I would I would hand hold this one about seventy five percent. That that one's very fatiguing. Uh, and this one has a seven millimeter exit pupil, a twenty millimeters eye relief. Uh, it's still two point three pounds because it's the same family. You get a lot less shake when you're hand holding it, uh, and you can see. Uh, 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 but you can see a lot more detail when you do have it on the monopod. So I love this monopod. It's one of my best buys. So why don't you take this, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go <laughs> on to the next topic. So, uh, um, so why large binoculars? Why do you want to have large binoculars? Well, you, you get the natural uh, two-eye viewing, the twice the aperture of uh, the monocular. Uh, the large aperture enables you to see dimmer deep sky objects, greater detail. Uh, you still get wider true fields than the, the telescope, but it's not as wide as the smaller binoculars that I showed here. Uh, so the smaller ones are more portable than the larger telescope, but not as portable as the hand ones. The disadvantage of large binoculars is 70 millimeters or more requires tripods, as you can see over there. And that has extra setup time and extra weight. Um, you know, uh, straight through, you're limited to about 70 degrees looking up. So this one over here is a straight through binocular uh, and you're limited and you, you, you know, it's very easy to aim but you have your neck limit. Uh, the 45 and the 90 degree binoculars, uh, those you're able to point straight up at the zenith. So I'm just going to walk over here and you could see that I can, I can I can look straight into it. So I can get down here and look in. Over here, I can look up. You know, but I can look right at the zenith. And that's very important because that's the best part of the sky. You can see the dimmest objects up there and less atmosphere to look through, looking right. straight up. Yep. Uh, but straight through, you can only get up 70 degrees. Okay? What can you see with large binoculars? Well, you can see M31. Uh, uh, and I brought these ones up to the top of Mauna Kea, uh, and that was the best view of M31 I ever saw. Uh, they're three degree field of view, but it, one of those field of views had a drama that filled up 80% of the view, and panning it over for the second one, that had about 40% in. So that was a really great view. Uh, also, the Pleiades and Beehive uh, star clusters look awesome, especially like uh, this past November when you had. Uh, the moon passed right in front of the Hades, so That's you right. get to see a lot of occulting stars. The Sword of Orion, uh, you know, looks so awesome seeing M42 visible with the whole sword and all those other objects in there. M81, 82 in the same view. Uh, multiple deep sky objects in the same view. Um, like, um, and multiple planets in the same view. I, I, I love looking at multiple planets. Um, and then Sunspots, uh, you know, so I have solar filters, you know, and that you can put on these binos, and I did bring them out to uh, um, Casper, Wyoming. Um, That's where you observe the uh, solar eclipse. Right, right. Yeah. looking at the solar eclipse, and even just sunspots, you know, so, okay. uh, you know, you, you, can, you can do that for daytime viewing. Um, yep, uh, and, uh, but you, these are white light filters, so you only see the sunspots. You don't see the prominences with, uh, with those two filters. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, the 25 by 100 Apogee uh, straight through binos. So like I said, they're limited to 70-degree uh, neck azimuth. Um, it is a fixed eyepiece, and I also have uh, these uh, marine rubber uh, view, um, blinders, which uh, block out stray light um, and... Uh, Those you would use if you're doing daytime observing of the sun? I'd use it for nighttime because it blocks out the stray light and, and you I don't have okay. any reflection on the eyepieces. Uh, that was a, a very nice uh, ad that I put into it. So this one, um, it's fixed eyepieces and it gives you 25 power, three and a half degrees true field of view. Although Cloudy Night says it's uh, less, a lot, of, a lot of binoculars advertise much wider field of views than they really have. It's very inexpensive. Uh, it was only 
It was under $300, so it's lightweight. I used a simple camera tripod, which is uh, very undersized for it, but it makes it very portable and lightweight to travel, so I took that one up to Mauna Kea with me uh, for to, to, to see uh, Andromeda. Um, Cloudy Nights recommends getting a heavier, stiller, taller, more expensive tripod for stability and less vibration. Uh, disadvantage is I can't look up at the zenith. Uh, there's no space for your head to, and neck to do so, and your neck is limited. Uh, and it's more difficult uh, to mount the bino on a tripod than the Versigo. Okay, Which, and that, that's the next one I'll be talking about. So this one is a 100 millimeter uh, right angle binocular. You can see the eyepieces are angled at right angles. I have my Teleview eyepieces in here, and one of our club members, uh, he tightened down the eyepieces, and they got actually got stuck. So oh my, uh, yeah. So those indents on the barrels, you know, you got to be real careful. So I don't really tighten these down uh, on here. Uh, so uh, with these binoculars, you, you you have 90 degrees. You're able to point straight up at the zenith, and you're able to look really easily. Um, and and that's really what they were designed to do. Um, you're able to swap out eyepieces. They come out very easy. You just get, you just get uh, different eyepieces, swap them in and out uh, for different powers and different uh, field of views. Um, uh, so typically, they, uh, we have uh, 22 power. Yep. Um, and uh, I use a 24 uh, millimeter 68 uh, pan optics eyepieces in there for the widest field of view. Um, and uh, the one thing I like uh, with the VersaGo mount, it's very easy to install because you can snap that out and uh, you know put it on the the binos and then put it in there. Um, and uh, the effective aperture is uh, about 80, 80 millimeters according to Cloudy Nights. But uh, and I wish this did have a red dot finder, which we'll talk about uh, in the next binocular. So. Uh, the next binocular is a Garrett optical. Uh, you can see it does have a, uh, a, a red dot finder on here, which, which is, make, makes it easy to point at objects. It has a 45 degree tilt, and you can point it right up at the zenith and still look at it. So when you're looking at the zenith, you have to be looking at 45 degrees, whereas this one, you can look horizontally when you're looking at the zenith. And uh, this one is a lot harder to get onto the tripod than the burst amount. But there is a disadvantage, the burst amount does rotate on you, so you have to be really cautious about being level, because otherwise you can get out of balance. So this seems like uh, you've got quite a collection of uh, binoculars here, Ken. Um, it, it really highlights the advantages of uh, going this route versus the telescope, uh, especially from a cost standpoint of uh, sticking your foot in the water, so to speak, to see if you really like the hobby before you sink uh, some big bucks or your co child's college education <laughs> into a large telescope. Well, I want to thank Ken for being on the program to bring us this update on binoculars. Uh, we uh, ask that uh, you visit our website. We, we kind of like it, so we hope that you like what you find there, too. And since this is our holiday program, I want to wish everyone happy holidays. And coming up next is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. What's up in the night sky for December 2017? Uh, the sunrise and sunset don't change very much this month, only by maybe 10 minutes over the course of the month. And that's because we have the winter solstice that's in the northern hemisphere, of course, on December 21st. Uh, so sunrise is about 8 a.m. and sunset is about 5 p.m. here in Michigan. Astronomical night is you add uh, an hour and 40 minutes at, in the evening, and you subtract an hour and 40 minutes in the morning. And basically, that, is, that stands true for the whole night. It's the same to get the dark part of the, the night sky. 
We start with a full moon on the December 3rd and a third quarter moon on the 10th, new moon on the 18th, uh, uh, first quarter on the 26th. And since the 26th is so early in the month for the last of the moons, you expect another moon, and that comes actually full moon again on January 1st, which is not technically in December. So here we are looking at December 31st at uh, 8, 10 a.m., at least from here in Michigan. And I included the sun here in the lower left just to show how close Venus is to the sun. It's not very, uh, it's not very far. This is the end of the month, December 31st shot. Venus is better at the beginning of the month. Uh, Mercury is in Sagittarius to Ophiuchus, so Ophiuchus is not one of the uh, horoscope constellations, uh, but, it, but the sun do does go through it, and so do the planets. Uh, it sets, Mercury sets at 6.04 out on the first of the month, and then rises at 6.18 a.m. at the end of the month, and that's because we have an inferior conjunction when, the, when Mercury goes between the Earth and the sun. Uh, that's December 12th. It's also perihelion, which means that, the, that Mercury is as close to the sun as it gets, so it's zipping by. So uh, it actually, we actually get a very good uh, Mercury at the end of the month with an altitude that is the distance from the, the angular distance from the sun of 26.7 degrees. That's awesome for Mercury. So uh, Venus is in Libra to Sagittarius, rises uh, from about 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, it's best at the beginning of the month. Uh, Mars is in Libra, rises uh, 4 a.m. to uh, a little after 3 a.m. It's best at the end of the month. We ha we're going for an opposition in July, so that's quite a long time from now. Um, Jupiter is in Libra and rises at 5.19 to 3.50 a.m. Uh, it's best at the end of the month. Saturn is in Sagittarius and it sets at, seven, uh, at 6, 10 p.m., and then rises at 7, 26 a.m., and that's because we have superior conjunction right on the solstice on the 21st. Um, so this is not a, good, uh, uh, not a good month for Saturn. And then finally, we have on the, shown on the 31st, we have Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And we're showing this at just, uh, just after sunset at 5, 15 p.m., Uranus is in Pisces and sets at uh, 4 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, it's best um, at the beginning of the month, uh, and it's best to watch it uh, at uh, 9 to uh, really 7 a.m., right? Follow the sunrise uh, when it's still pretty dark. Uh, Neptune is in Aquarius, and Pluto is in Sagittarius, and that is what's up in the night sky. Uh, uh, here at Astronomy for Everyone, the sky is free, but we may tax your brain.